You're listening to another inspiring teaching from Devonport Church of Christ, Tasmania, Australia. For more information about our church, please log on to www.devonportcoc.com.au. So my dad is an engineer. And so growing up, we used to tell each other lots of stories of those times when foundations failed or the wonderful engineering oops pictures. I remember uh, one of my favourite pictures is the picture of the people building a bridge and you've got one end coming in there and you've got one end coming in there and they missed by that much. And as I was thinking about what I would share this morning, there was one story in particular that that kept coming back into my head and that is the story of the Mars Climate Orbiter spacecraft. So in September of 1999, NASA had sent this orbiter spacecraft to Mars. It was a 10-month journey. It had taken years of construction before that, and they had finally reached the day where they were going to send it into orbit around the red planet. They were excited. Its job was to connect with some of the equipment that was already on the ground. It was to get data on the climate of Mars, obviously. And they punched the button that was meant to send it into that wonderful high orbit. And instead, they watched in horror as it flew directly to the surface of the planet, the planet in a fiery red fireball. Now, the mistake in question from that day didn't actually happen because of an operator on the day. It didn't happen because of anything that had happened on the 10-month journey. The, the question in, or the problem actually happened during construction. You see, NASA, because they deal with a lot of international agencies, they, they're smart. They use the metric system. Meters, centimeters, kilometers, etc. Unfortunately, the company that had built their propulsion unit for them was based in America and used the imperial measurements. Inches, feet, and yards. Now, anybody who is used to using those would know that it doesn't work one-to-one. One meter is not the same as one foot. And so when they sent the coordinates for where they were to send this spacecraft, they sent it in metric, it received it in imperial, and it went smush into the planet. A very big and expensive mistake. And Dad and I love that story. We love it because it's a very expensive mistake and we didn't make it. But (laughs) Dad and I also use that story to share with each other, to remind each other to check your foundational assumptions because sometimes you can make an assumption that is wrong. And there are times when our foundations are incorrect and they need to be checked and corrected. And so we're here in the first week or first topical week of our foundation series. And Blake started this series off last week with, an introduction that dealt with the parable of the wise and the foolish man. The men who built their house on the rock and on the sand, and we know that the house on the rock that had a firm and solid foundation stood in all the storms. And if we want to build lives of significance, if we want to build lives that stand the test, then we need to make sure that we are building on the rock. And so this series, we're going to be going through a whole bunch of topics and giving you an opportunity to check your foundations to check to make sure that what you are building on is strong and secure. But I also know that as I'm talking this week, that there are going to be some people who think, I know this. You're talking about things I already know, so why do we need to go over this? Well, I've learned that one of the best ways to work out if you actually know something is to explain it to somebody else. And so I would challenge you and encourage you to take your faith wide throughout this series and use these sermons, use these foundations as a way of checking to make sure that you have the concept so you can explain it to somebody else. Does that make sense? Sweet. All right. Now, I'm going to be trying to provide the foundations of God today, and let me tell you that there is a lot that I could speak about. In fact, there is so much that I could speak about that we're going to speak for three hours, and we'll have a short intermission and toilet break, and then we'll go for round two. The fact is, I could be here every week for the next year, and I could still only be scratching the surface of this topic of God. By the way, for those who are visiting, don't worry, I'm not going to speak that long. 
But there is su- this is such a big topic to try and tackle. And the entire Bible displays so many different things about God that I could talk about. For example, I could talk about the fact that God is the ultimate foundation. As the creator of the universe, He is the ultimate foundation. He is that which all creation rests upon and sits upon. He's the ultimate foundation. He's there beneath it all. I could speak of God's holiness, the fact that God is holy, that He is set apart and pure, and that because of sin, we are not, and the complications that arise from that. I could speak of God's three omnis, the fact that God is omnipresent, that He is everywhere at all times, that He is omniscient, that He knows all things, and that He is omnipotent, that He is all-powerful. I could speak about those three omnis and what they mean for God, but I could also talk about the fact that Satan is none of those things. And that would be a very good and very powerful thing to share. I could speak of God's character, the fact that He is loving and merciful, that He is full of grace and justice and truth, that He is kind and compassionate, and all those other wonderful words that we use to describe God. And I can speak of the fact that God is our defender, that He is our strong tower, our fortress, the one that we can run to when the storms of life come and we can hide in Him. He is our shield that we may face the things that happen in this world and that He is there for those who cannot defend themselves. And I could speak about the fact that God is a judge and that at one point everyone will stand before His throne and have to give an account. And that will look very different for those who know Jesus and those who don't. And I'd love to be able to deal with all of those things and more. I'd love to be able to talk about God as Father and what that means for us and all these things, but I can't. And so instead, I'm going to be sharing just a small part of who God is today. And I know that I'm going to be missing things that I consider are foundational to who God is. But I can also guarantee that I'm going to be missing things that are foundational to who you think God is but I can't deal with it all. And so instead, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to, I'm going to share the things that I've been challenged to share with you. And the first thing that I want to do is this. I want to ask the question, who is God? Because I think that so many different people would have a different answer to this question. In fact, just last week, I had a conversation with a telemarketer trying to get me to change my energy company. And as I was talking to him on the phone, I remembered those times when people have asked me, generally tongue-in-cheek, well, did you share the gospel with them? And I was in that kind of mood. (laughs) So I thought, I'm on the phone, why not? Now, the first thought that came into my head is, he's trying to sell me energy, maybe I should see if he knows who the ultimate energy provider is. And then I decided, no, I'm not going to go that corny. And so, in probably not my greatest or most prepared moment, All I kind of blurted out was, do you know who Jesus Christ is? Well, it stopped his spiel. I can say that. (laughs) And I should probably stop and mention at this point too that this sermon is being recorded for training and quality control purposes. (laughs) So the question about who Jesus Christ is stopped this telemarketer for like a second and then he responded with a very suspicious why. Why? And so I explained that I was a minister and I was wanting to know if he knew who Jesus was. His response kind of surprised me. He said, everybody knows who Jesus Christ is. And I went, that's an interesting answer. When I tried to ask more questions, he said, he's not allowed to discuss religious beliefs while on phone calls. And so that, after that, the phone conversation got a lot more boring. <laughs> but the answer that he gave me made me think, Everybody knows who Jesus Christ is. And I think that there are people out there who would say that everybody knows who God is. And I know that that's not true. There are people who don't know who God is. There are people who don't know who Jesus is. But at the same time, I think that there are a lot of people who have ideas about who God is. There are a lot of people who believe that they know who God is, that they've got him figured out, but they don't. And I can tell you right now that there are a lot of people who may not use these words, but they see God as a vending machine. And there is nowhere in the Bible that God is described as a vending machine. God is never described as a vending machine that you can go to and you can push the right buttons. You can use exactly the right combination of words and you're going to get what you want. 
And if you don't get what you prayed for, if you don't get the right things, then, well, we obviously didn't press the buttons properly. We didn't try hard enough. We didn't have enough passion in our prayers. God is also never described as a genie in heaven, someone who only exists to answer our wishes, to magic us up solutions to all of life's problems. And if He doesn't answer you, then it obviously means that you've already used your wishes. He's also not like a genie from some of those old fairy tales where you have to be very careful with the wording because He will give you exactly what you ask for and not what you wanted. That's not who God is. That's not who He's described as in the Bible. God is not this being who is sitting in heaven looking for opportunities where you do the wrong thing and you step out of line just so that He can punish you in cruel and imaginative ways as an example to others. Those things are just not who God is. And the world has so many different concepts and ideas about who He is. We pick these up through the shows that we watch, through the books that we read, through the conversations and the interactions that we have with people, through the families that we grow up in. But we also just pick up these ideas of God through the way that we interpret life. So I want to answer this question of who is God, but I'm going to use the Bible because I figure the Bible is the Word of God, it's probably got something important to say about the topic. And so in our Bible reading today, we have the story of Moses and the burning bush. Now a little bit of context for this story, the Israelites are slaves in Egypt. Moses has run away from Egypt, he has found a wife in the desert and he is now looking after the sheep for his father-in-law minding his own business and his father-in-law's at the same time. And while he's in the desert looking after the sheep, probably a very boring job, he sees a tree that is on fire. The tree is burning, but at the same time, the tree is not being consumed, and I'd love to be able to just stop there and explore that picture of God, but I can't. But he goes, that's very curious, it's very interesting. So he goes up to it, and as he goes up to it, he hears a voice that says, stop, take off your sandals, because where you are standing is holy ground. Because where God shows up, it's a holy place. And so Moses and God have this conversation, and God says, I want you to lead my people out of slavery. I want you to take them into the promised land. And Moses kind of says to God, well, I'm not... I'm not going to agree to do this yet, but if I did, who am I meant to say that you are? Because Moses understands something very important, and that is that every nation and his dog has a different God. They all have different names, they all have different powers. Moses grew up in Egypt where they had a cacophony of different gods. So he asks, who is it who is sending me? And God responds in verse 14, God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. This is how God chooses to name himself. Now, to the Hebrew people, names were important. Names are more than just this collection of sounds that you call out to get somebody's attention. They were a description of who you were as a person. And that's why you see people in the Bible who have their names changed or who choose to change their names. Naomi into Mara, Abram into Abraham, Jacob into Israel. They needed a new description of who they were. And what God is doing here with Moses is He is giving them a name, something to call Him, but He's also giving a description of who He is. God says, I am who I am. I want you to just pause and let that wash over you for a second. God says, I am who I am. Now, you may look at that and think, what on earth does that mean? Because I know that I've done that many times. I can see that there's something important there, but it has not made any sense whatsoever. Moses asked for a name and he got that. Well, the first thing that the name of God reveals to us is that God defines who He is. We don't define God. God defines who He is, not us. All too often, people come to God with their ready-made ideas about who He is. We expect Him to fit into our designs. We expect Him to fit into this box that we've got in our heads that's about so big, and it's got God on it, and it fits in a really nice slot next to all the other parts of our life. 
But God is so much bigger than that. God is so much greater than that. We come to God, we think that we are in control and we can define Him. We might want to say that He's the creator of the universe, but He's the creator of the universe that we've made up in our own heads. And that doesn't work. We can't do that. We need to understand that God is the one who defines who He is. We are not in control. God is. This is such a huge and important thing for us to understand because if we can't understand this, then we are constantly going to be following our own idols and gods with a little g that we have made up. And they may contain traces of God, but they are not God. We need to be willing to humble ourselves and allow the truth of God, the truth of who He is to flow into us, not hinder it by trying to change it so that it fits into the box that we have. See, one of the really important things about a foundation is not only is it something that is secure that you can attach a building to, not, is it, not only is a foundation something that is big and solid and shouldn't move, a foundation and a building slab is also designed to level it out so that you are building on something that is balanced and flat so that everything that comes from that point is on the right angles. And that's where the idea of allowing God to define Himself is so important because when we try to define God, we're going to overemphasize some parts of Him and we're going to underemphasize others. Because when we begin to define God, we remember maybe that God is a judge. We remember that He is just and a judge and so we emphasize that. We start to feel like God is watching us, that He's making a note of every time we make a mistake Every time we stuff up, he is looking at it and he is writing it down in his great big book and tisking as he goes. And that there is nothing that we can do about it. When we see God only as a judge, we forget about his love and his mercy and his grace that is displayed in Jesus Christ. That grace that was poured out for us even while we were sinners that has covered every wrong, that forgiveness that is complete and total, that has nothing that needs to be added to it. Or when we define God, we can make the opposite mistake. We can overemphasize God's grace and His mercy and His forgiveness. We can begin to live the lives that Paul talks about in Romans when he makes the comment, well, if that's the case, then shouldn't we go on sinning so that God's grace can increase? When we only focus on God's love and mercy and His grace, we forget that God is holy. We forget that He is holy and pure and set apart and that sin is abhorrent to Him. We forget that we miss that. And so we begin to live out a mindset that says, it doesn't matter that I know this behavior is wrong because God's going to forgive me. We start to replace God with a genie in the sky that's never going to say no to us. So what God is trying to tell us is that He doesn't need us to define Him because He has already defined Himself. God knows exactly who He is, because He is God. I am who I am. And the Hebrew for that statement could also be put as He is. Before anything else, He is. God was. He is there, and He will always be there. There is this sense of completeness contained within this name of God. He is complete because He doesn't need to look to the people around Him to find out who He is. God does not gain His worth through creation. He is not measured by His acts. Instead, God is defined by Himself, solely and completely by Himself. And this is such an important idea that we need to realize about God. His completeness and His sovereignty are all part of this. But we need to make sure that our view of the universe is the correct one. Because all too often, people think that they are the center of the universe and everything revolves around them. Or perhaps we think that humankind is the center of the universe and everything revolves around us. That's the wrong view. The right view is where we put God in the center of the universe and all of creation revolves around Him because He is the center. He is the creator. He is the ultimate one. We revolve around Him and our lives are defined by that truth that God defines Himself that he is found complete in and of himself with no need of an outside force. Now, Blake shared last week uh, about the wise man who built his house upon the rock. 
And Jesus taught from that parable that the wise man was building his life upon the rock when he not only heard the words of Jesus, but when he put them into practice. When he didn't merely hear the words, but he put them into action, he acted upon them. He allowed the words of God to change him, to affect his behaviors and his actions. He understood that his place was not to fit God into his box and his place, but instead to allow the truth and the words of God to flow into him and change him. And that is what we are called to do as well, because our understanding of God needs to come from who God is, not from the examples that are placed around us in the world. We need to allow God to be the one that sets the dimensions of who he is. Way back in Genesis, at the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis 1, 26 to 27, God says, well, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. We are made in the image of God. We are made in that image. And so, and so when we try to define ourselves, we need to remember that we are not complete. We are a reflection of the one that is complete. And so we require and we need to have other influences speaking into that question of who we are because we were made to reflect God. And when we look at the people around us, though, we need to remember that they are broken, just like we are broken. They are also hurting, just like we are hurting. They are also making decisions that are acting out of a deep need to be wanted and liked to find out who they are, just like we are acting out of that same need. When we base our identities on the people around us, we create a feedback loop that feeds back into itself, and it gets worse and worse and worse and brings out the worst characteristics. But instead when we're able to focus and find our identities not in the broken images and pieces of God scattered around us in other people, but when we base our identities in the one from whose image we came from, who is not broken, who is in himself complete, then we find the foundation for who we are and who we are intended to be. Because by God defining himself, by God letting us know that he didn't need us to define him, He has given us the place and the space to define ourselves in Him. And that is not to say that we are and are meant to be everything that God is. We aren't God. But when we're able to look at God, we're able to find the purpose for which we are created. Our identities find their solid foundation. And so the first thing this morning that I want to share is that by God defining Himself, He reveals Himself as complete and central And we need to know that we are not in control, and instead we need to seek to humble ourselves before Him and allow ourselves to be changed by the truth of who God is. And the second thing that I want to speak about is the fact that God is eternal and unchanging. When God revealed Himself as, I am who I am, He was not only revealing Himself as one who is complete in and of Himself, He was also revealing something about his nature. He was helping people to understand what his relationship to time was. As we read on in Exodus 3.15, we see it come out a bit further. God also said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, the name you shall call me from generation to generation. Here, God is revealing his relationship to to time. He's reminding Moses of the fact that he is the same God who called Abraham, who was with Isaac, who wrestled with Jacob, those people from Moses' family tree that Moses had heard stories of. And then God continues to reveal that this will be his name forever, the name that future generations will know him by. He is revealing that he is God and his view of time is different to ours. See, God sees the details. God sees the minutes that pass us by. God sees the seconds and the microseconds and the nanoseconds and the picoseconds and so on. He sees each of them tick by. And he sees the details of what is happening in that time. 
But God can also stand back and see from creation to the end of time. The whole incredible mosaic tapestry mural of time. He can see the ultimate picture and he knows where everything is going and what it connects to. He knows the details, but he also knows the whole. And there is something more that we can get from this. God promises that his, this will be his name forever, that he will always be God, he will always be complete. James writes in James 1, 17, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. Here, James described God as one who does not change. His eternal nature means that God is unchanging, that He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that, and so on. God doesn't change. He's not like people who say one thing and do another. He's not like the person who changes their mind every time they open their mouth. God is different to that. He is unchanging, and this is such an important concept for us to understand about Him. Why? Because if God is unchanging, then that means that we can trust Him. If God is unchanging, then that means that His promises are trustworthy. His promises are true. His character is secure. He will not change. He's not going to change the way that He looks at you or the way that He loves you. So many of us are used to people holding their love back when we fail or changing when they no longer need us. We are so used to the people around us using us for what we can give them or even changing depending on who they are around. We're used to people being like shifting shadows. Isn't that a great phrase to describe some people? Shifting shadows. Yet even though we are used to being treated like that, we can have confidence in the fact that God is not like that. He is complete. He doesn't need us, but He wants us. He doesn't need us, but He wants us. He is complete. He's not going to act a certain way around us during church, and then if we try to approach Him during the week, act in a completely different way. He is unchanging. He is solid. He is complete. He is there. Yet I know that one of the things that people might bring up when I talk to them about the fact that God is unchanging is they say, what about this? Or what about that? And they bring up examples where God changes His mind. They say that God can't be unchanging because He's changed His mind. Therefore, He is just like us and we can't trust Him. And they use examples like the story of Jonah. I want to look at that story just quickly. So Jonah is called by God to go and to give the Ninevites a message. He's told to tell them that because of their wickedness, judgment is coming upon them and that they will be destroyed. Now, Jonah runs, there's a big fish, there's repentance in the fish, there's vomiting on the shores of Nineveh, the fish, not Jonah. And Jonah goes and preaches the message that God has sent him to preach, eventually. And the king of Nineveh, when he's told about the news, got off the throne, he put on sackcloth, he put on ashes, and he sat in the dirt. That's a sign of repentance, And all of Nineveh declared a fast about the news that had come to them. And then in Jonah chapter 3, verse 10, it says, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, He relented and He did not bring on them the destruction that He had threatened. God relented. You could say that He changed His mind, not because He had made a mistake, not because all of a sudden He had new information, He relented from what he was going to do because the people repented of what they had done. They realized the error of their ways and God's character never changed. Yes, he is a judge and he is just and he will pursue justice. He delivers verdicts according to what people have done. But he is also loving and compassionate. He is full of grace and mercy. He sees people who repent and He provides the compassion and the mercy to support them in that. He might repent or He might relent and in one sense change His mind, but His character never changes. His character, who He is, is something that is eternal and unchanging. It is something that we can rely on, that we can trust, which is good because that provides a solid foundation that we can stand on. 
Because it means that when we make mistakes, and trust me, we will, we know that God is not going to leave us or forsake us. It means that when we fail, when we have those feelings of guilt and shame, it means that we can stand on the promises of God that say that Christ died for us even while we were still sinners. That even though we have failed, even though we have made mistakes, that doesn't change the way that God feels about us. He still loves us. He still cares for us. Christ has still died for us. And it means that when we are facing issues and storms in life, we can know that God has not changed from Moses' time or Jacob's time or the time of the early church. He is still a God of miracles and power. He is still a God who was described as a fortress and a strong tower, and He is still a fortress and a strong tower for us today. He is still our shield and very great reward. We can remember those things and those stories, and we can know that the God that we follow is the same. And that gives us hope and a foundation to stand on. And the final thing that I want to share about God today It's one of the most famous doctrines about God, and yet it is also the one that confuses the most people and makes people think that Christians have lost their ability to use logic and do maths. And that's the doctrine of the Trinity. Now, if you do a search through your Bible, or more likely use Google to do a search through your Bible, you'll see that the term Trinity does not appear in the Bible. But that doesn't mean that this doctrine is not biblical. The basis of this doctrine exists all through the Bible. We see the truth through so many different aspects, all the way from Genesis to Revelation. We saw in the verse that I shared before that God said, let us make mankind in our own image. We're made in the image of God. God was talking amongst himself. But we also see it in Revelation where Jesus is described as the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. And so the God that we worship is one. As Christians, we are monotheistic. We have one God, but as Christians, we also understand that God exists as three distinct persons. Now, this is not to say that we follow three gods. And this is not saying that we believe in one God who at one time appeared as God the Father, who at another time appeared as God the Son, Jesus Christ, and now appears to us as God the Holy Spirit. It's not what we're saying at all. It is also not to say that we believe in one God who has two smaller demigods alongside Him. We believe in one God that exists in three persons. All are fully divine, all are God, and all are complete in and of themselves. And that's where my head starts hurting. And there are lots of ways that we could describe this relationship and this concept. And the thing is, most of those descriptions, most of those examples and illustrations fail in some way because we're trying to use something physical to describe something that is not. And the fact is, until we reach the other side of eternity, we're not going to completely understand it. And even then, I don't know, we'll see. But this doctrine of the Trinity is both essential and foundational and an incredibly complex idea that theologians keep trying to discuss and work out what it means and keep getting very confused themselves. And so I don't want to go into massive depth for this, because while I find it fascinating at times, I also know that discussing this for too long is a surefire way to make my eyes glaze over and my head to start thumping. So let's keep it to the foundations today. And the foundation is this. We worship one God who exists as three distinct persons. God the Father, God the Son, Jesus Christ, and God the Holy Spirit. All are God. And this foundation tells us something that is so important about who God is. It tells us that God exists in community and is relational. God has always existed and He will always exist in community. It is an essential part of who He is. While Jesus is the Son of God, there has never been a time when Jesus was not. Same with the Holy Spirit. Same with God the Father. All three have always existed and they have always lived and operated in community. And when we were made in the image of God, we were made with this in us as well. We were built for relationship. We were built for community. We were made for relationship and community with God first and foremost and then with other people. But now we've been broken by sin. 
We've been separated from God. We no longer have that as our primary understanding of who we are, that primary relationship in our lives. And so we fill that void with other people and we fill that void with other things. But that need for relationship and that need for community, rather than it finding its primary fulfillment in God like it was intended, we look for it amongst other broken people. And that's where issues occur. But when we understand that this, when we understand this about God, it helps us to understand ourselves in knowing that we were made, we were intended for community and relationship. And it doesn't matter if you are introverted or extroverted. We are all made and intended for relationship and community. It just means that the way we express that is different and the way that we crave it is different. But we all need it. And we all value it. But the fact that God exists in community and is relational tells us something else that is incredibly important too. It tells us that God is wanting to be involved. God is not a God who is sitting up on his throne watching us carefully marking down all the good things and the bad things that we do and preparing for judgment day. He's also not a God who is sitting on a lazy boy armchair watching reruns of Touched by an Angel in Seventh Heaven. Not interested in what's going on here. God is relational. He is desiring to be involved and engaged with what is happening here on earth. God is relational. He's interested in what is going on in your lives. God is relational. He's wanting to know what is stressing you out. He's wanting you to talk to Him about the awful day that you have just had. And you know what? God is wanting you to talk to Him about that guy at work that just keeps giving you a hard time. He wants to know about the boss that makes you angry and frustrated and annoyed. He wants to know about the things that happen in your day because He is relational. He is interested. He is focused on us. Now, Psalm 139 says that before a word is on my tongue, you know it completely, O God. God knows it before we speak it. He still wants us to speak it. And He wants us to speak it because that's part of relationship. That's part of getting to know somebody. That's part of building that relationship. But that that Psalm speaks of some incredible truths about the fact that God is intimately interested in who we are. He is wanting to know us more. He is not just after followers. He is not just after worshippers. He is after a relationship with His creations. Not to complete Him. Not to fulfill a need for Him. He is already complete. But because He wants to. It is who He is and that is not going to change. And that relational side of God, that means that he doesn't want to just get to know us. He doesn't just want us to tell him about us. It means that he wants to reveal who he is as well. And the Bible is the word of God. From Genesis to Revelation, it is a story of God. It is God revealing himself to his people. It is God describing who he is. It is people inspired by the Holy Spirit writing down who God is. And so the Word of God is such a great way to get to know God, but there is another way that you can get to know God and you want to know what it is. You ask. You ask God, who are you? And then you stop and you listen. And you wait for Him to respond because God is relational. He is wanting to reveal Himself to us. He is wanting us to know Him and He wants to know about us. It is a two-way relationship. And he is offering that to us. We need only say yes. And the thing that I'm going to finish off with is this. Over all of these things, over all these aspects of God, all the foundational things, his character traits, the elements of who he is, what I've spoken about and what I have not spoken about, we need to remember that God is not just loving. He is loving love itself. God is love. That is who He is. So over all these things that I've spoken about, all these things that I've shared about, we need to remember that there is such an incredible sense of love that infuses every part of it. This is more than just having the character trait of loving. It is something at the very core of who God is. He is love. And it changes and it affects every single part of Him and our relationship with Him. 